Okay, hello. Hey, welcome everybody to App Dev Insecurity, also known as Don't Panic, A Hitchhiker's Guide to Software Security. Um, my name is Rosalie Tolentino. And I'm Jack Singleton. And um, we'll be introducing you to the journey that we took over the past six or seven months now uh, through security, coming from a very dev, app dev background. Oh, and uh, before we move on, I just want to tell you that that really is Jack's last name. Um, okay, so like I mentioned before, we are application developers. Um, we've done integration tests, unit tests, uh, CI, continuous delivery, um, and we, we wanted to tackle security, and it had been something that Jack and I were interested in before, um, before coming to ThoughtWorks even. Um, we, we first, before, before we started like actually working on security, we were, we were doing a lot of things around the office in our extra time because of our passion. Um, those include hosting secure drop hackathons, uh, playing around with WebGoat, which is um, an insecure application that I'll talk about later, and also hosting um, video, video get-togethers where we watch um, presentations from conferences focused directly on security. And uh, because we were doing all of these events, somebody from uh, ThoughtWorks contacted us uh, and, and they said, hey, would you be interested in, in exploring security full time um, with the understanding that we're going to give back to the community, not just ThoughtWorks internally, but also um, the greater community around security. And we both looked at each other and we were like, yeah, we want to do this, of course. Yeah. Um, let's see. That's our journey. Um, so when we started, we actually rolled off of our projects as consultants onto the beach. And if you don't know what the beach is, it's, it's an area where people sit and wait for their next uh, project at a consultancy. It's not actually a beach, although, <laughs> uh, but it's a time that we spend between projects. <laughs> yeah, so um, because both of us had been introduced to security in different ways in the past, we decided that uh, we wanted to do our own personal exploration. And for me, that meant um, handling the book Hacking the Art of Exploitation, which is really interesting. It was something that I picked up when I was in college at Santa Clara University studying computer engineering, but I didn't actually have time to um, go through each paragraph and, and do all the exercises, so I thought, why not, why not finish it this time? Um, and if you haven't picked up the book before, it's pretty dense. Uh, it goes through understanding some assembly, definitely C programming, um, what are the different bits in a TCP packet, and uh, shell code, why is that created, how do people um, use it to exploit programs. It's, it's, there's a lot of information in there, uh, so it, it did take some time. And I started looking at cryptography. I worked through the Madisano Crypto Challenges which are at CryptoPals.org, another great resource. And we will have all these resources on, on slides as we go through. Um, so what the Madisano Crypto Challenges are, are a set of exercises that you work through in the language of your choosing. And they take you from very basic things like dealing with different encodings uh, all the way through at the end to implementing like AES and stream ciphers uh, manually. Um, so I didn't work through all of these, but I worked through a handful of them. And um, and I had a had a great time doing it. And this was so this was a very it was a very explorative time for us. It was kind of branching out on our own and just like trying to get a feel for what this big security thing really meant. So we don't we don't actually have a lot of time to go through each of the different things that we learned specifically, but we want to present some takeaways that you can um, you can grab from us. One of those is understanding exploits is really difficult and fun. Um, understanding exploits from the book that I read meant you have to, uh, you have to understand how registers are being used, um, what does memory segmentation look like as code is being executed, how do people take advantage of the architecture of the system um, that's, that's uh, running through code in order to uh, produce different results or even malicious results. Um, so it, it was a lot to ingest, but and challenging, but that's also what made it fun and interesting, um, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. Another takeaway that we got from this was that uh, the design of the software or even the environment around the software 
that you're using can be a major blocker to security. If people aren't, um, if, if people haven't thought about security early on, then, then you could be working against a very endemic uh, problem. Um, the other thing that uh, I wanted to impart to you, uh, part, part, of these, part of the talk today is gonna be about the mistakes that we made and how you can learn from them. Um, and one of them was that like, the Hacking the Art of Exploitation book isn't really, really useful in your day to day unless you're programming C or unless you want to become very serious about um, understanding memory exploits and becoming a security professional in that particular uh, field. On the other hand, if you do interface with C libraries in your code and um, you're not, ideally you want to ask somebody who's a professional in this space to tell you if you're handling those, um, those interfaces properly. And even though I had a great time playing around with cryptography and looking at how uh, crypto algorithms are actually implemented and implementing them myself, it hasn't been useful to me yet working in the, in the level that we generally work as application developers. Um, except for one thing, which is that configuring encryption algorithms can be really dangerous. Uh, there are lots of different options. It's not just, okay, I'll take AES. It's AES with this configuration, with these parameters, with these initialization vectors. And if you decide that you don't need an initialization vector for some reason, depending on how you're using this crypto, it could be a catastrophic mistake. Unless you know how these encryption algorithms work and you know what, what an initialization vector is used for, that's not an obvious mistake. And for most of us, it's just something that we're going to have to be careful when we're doing or avoid uh, doing ourselves. Yeah, so these are the resources that Jack promised just a minute ago. Um, I still recommend doing the, uh, doing the Madisano Crypto Challenges. I also recommend uh, checking out the, the book on hacking by John, John Erickson. Um, if, you're do, if you're seriously considering uh, becoming a, um, um, a security professional specifically. Uh, otherwise, um, like take those takeaways and um, um, that's all you really need from that. So, so we came to the end of our time on the beach and, and we got news that we, we would actually get this, this project, this next project of uh, looking at security full time and just diving into this space. So the first thing that came to our minds was pen testing. This is, I think, what a lot of people think of first when they start to think of security is, oh, how can we break existing systems? So a professional pen tester will look at systems that developers have created uh, and then actually try and break them. As they do, they'll go through in every step where they're able to compromise some part of the application, they'll document it. And the idea is that they compile this audit at the end of a pen test, give it back to the developers, and then the developers can go and fix each item, which is a very good thing. Um, and it's also a very interesting way of approaching security, right? You're, you're getting down there, you're, you're exploiting applications, you really, you really get to know what it means to be vulnerable, right? Um, and we had this idea that if we knew how the attacks worked, then we'd know how to defend against them. As application developers, we're very focused on functionality, we're always thinking of the happy path. What's, the, what's all the great stuff that my program could do? What we don't think of so often is what are all the bad things this program could do if the input that it's given is unexpected or if a certain sequence of events happen in an order that we didn't expect them to. Um, so we thought this would help our, our constructive programming. Um, and we both have a background in TDD, uh, which really led us to want to understand how, how these vulnerabilities work uh, so that we could fix them. If we knew how it was broken, then we could then fix it. So we took this pen, test, pen testing course through Offensive Security, a fairly well-respected company. Uh, they do a lot of these audits, and they also host uh, external training courses. Um, we, so we learned a ton of stuff, and a lot of what we learned are uh, tools. So all these, all these faint, faint tools here, they're all tools that this pen testing course went through teaching us. And there are tools for everything, tons of them, um, because a practical pen test covers a lot of ground. 
Uh, there are so many different ways that you can exploit an application. Uh, and you're trying to look at everything and then figure out if there are any holes in any of these places. And if you find something, then you dig deep into it. But a lot of it is gathering tons of information, doing a lot of scanning, and seeing what stands out. Um, as we went further through this course, we started to realize that the tools weren't really what we wanted to learn. We wanted to learn how vulnerabilities worked, how exploits work. We didn't necessarily want to learn uh, the you know, 50 tools that are required in order to conduct a professional pen test. Um, Metasploit is a big one. Uh, Metasploit's fairly popular. It's kind of like the Rails for pen testing, and it actually uses some of the Rails code base. Um, there are lots of Metasploit modules. They come out for every different vulnerability. There'll be a, a vulnerability that gets, uh, gets made public, and someone will write a Metasploit uh, module for it, which is great when you're conducting a professional pen test. But for us, we wanted to understand how these vulnerabilities actually worked, and loading a module into Metasploit and then clicking run uh, wasn't really a productive thing for us. But we did learn that application security is just one part of being secure. We, we think about the applications a lot because we're application developers, but there's so much more to it. Uh, you have a company's information security. Are they losing laptops, right? If we as a company lose a laptop, that has confidential information on it that lets an attacker know the layout of our internal networks, and that's gonna hurt us just as much as a bug in the application that we write. You also have the operational security, right? Uh, for ThoughtWorks, we're a consulting company, so we don't even host a lot of the applications we're developing. So we have our own operational security. Are, are, are we hosting servers uh, properly? And then we have our client's operational security. Once we develop a piece of software, are they actually hosting it securely? And then we have the uh, secure programming side of things, which is getting back to the coding, and, um, and are we actually putting holes in the applications that we're developing? So there's a lot of stuff there. Um, and these exploits don't have to be very advanced. We, through, uh, as part of the course, we went in a bit into how to identify a buffer overflow um, and how to actually write some Python code that would exploit a buffer overflow in a, in a program. But that's not what most of this was about. Most of it was about identifying all the versions of software that's running in a system and then just looking for known exploits. Because most of the time, within a big network, there's going to be software that's out of date. There are going to be known vulnerabilities for that software. And then you can either pull an exploit right off the public internet, or tweak it a bit, and then successfully compromise a system. So diligently updating your software is so important. Um, if you don't keep things up to date, then it doesn't take a cutting edge attacker to compromise your system. It just takes someone that can scan for versions of software and then look, look up vulnerabilities in public databases. And more often than not, vulnerabilities live in the details. It's not the front line uh, web servers that are serving 99% of the requests that your company is, uh, is hosting. Um, it's usually some service that's running on some random port that someone's forgotten about, no one really cares about. But if there's a problem with it, it could cause root access to the server it's running on and serve as a great uh, jumping off point for an attacker. Um, but at the end of all this, we'd really only scratched the surface of pen testing because it's a huge field and we'll get back to this again and again, I think, is that security is huge. It's a huge, huge space. And even pen testing is a field that people make careers in, in and of itself. So at the end of this couple of weeks, we learned a ton, but we, we weren't pen testers, right? Um, so, so I definitely recommend uh, the offensive security course. Uh, Probably not to every application developer though. If you're, if you're really interested in getting into pen testing specifically, and that's the direction you want to go in, then this is a great course to take. If not, then it's probably going to be too much. Um, 
Kali Linux, though, is uh, curated by the offensive security team. It's an open source uh, Linux distribution that includes all of these tools that we mentioned. Um, that's really easy to download, get running, and start playing around with, and you'll get some exposure to all of these tools. Uh, Seclis by Fidor is a great resource. So Fidor is the guy that uh, created Nmap, which is a really popular um, network scanning tool. And Seclis compiles a bunch of mailing lists uh, that you can subscribe to. Um, and this is, this is going to be great for keeping up to date with all the latest vulnerabilities that are coming out and, uh, and really getting into the security community. And then CVE da databases are uh, so valuable. You can, you can go to a CVE database, plug in the name of a piece of software that's running and its version, and pretty much instantly, um, if, there's a if there's a known public vulnerability for that version of software, there's a good chance you'll find it in one of these databases. And it's a really easy thing if there's a, if there's a suspect piece of software running on your network and you're kind of wondering about it, it has, hasn't been updated in a while, just, just do this and find out if there's a known problem. Okay, cool. So um, Jack and I, once again, we were looking for ways to uh, bring information about security to the rest of um, the development crew. Um, so one of the things that we realized is, hey, we, maybe we can't have everybody or have everybody do a pen testing co course. What else can we do? Uh, we started to explore security games because I love games. You like games? Yes. Okay. Who cool. doesn't? Okay. Cool. Um, so we we found a website called uh, OverTheWire.org. Has anybody heard of Over the Wire? Okay, great. Um, this is good. So Over the Wire hosts a bunch of war games, and all of them are designed to uh, help people explore different ways of thinking about applications uh, with a security um, with a security themed background, right? So the first one um, that I want to talk about is called Bandit. Uh, Bandit talks about the basics of uh, SSH and um, um, SSH into a remote machine. And also, like like basic Unix tools, like uh, Unique, um, Strings, Base64, all of these things that you actually need for higher levels of the game. Um, it was a really, really good starting point for people who aren't as like familiar with like the idiosyncrasies of Bash and stuff. Uh, the next one was Leviathan, and Leviathan was really fun because um, there were no, no helper hints at all. You just got like some mysterious binary that you had to uh, tease a password out of. So for each of these games, uh, you would have to um, either create, a, a trigger an escalation of privilege into the next level, or find a password that would get you to the next level. And Leviathan had more like, oh, uh, strange binaries, no hints, and stuff like that. Uh, Narnia asks you to, um, to recreate some of the basic C exploits um, that existed in the past. So um, you, for that, you have to understand memory segmentation, um, the book that I mentioned before, uh, how if you don't know like how to take advantage of the temp folder or like how to create a subshell in Bash, you're not going to have as much fun in um, the, the more advanced level games. Also, Krypton is another fun game that we played. Uh, it's more like it's more like Cryptopals, but not exactly. But the the theme is the same um, around cryptography. Let's see. So takeaways from doing this: um, we not only did we have fun playing these games, but we also wanted to take them to our friends. And we set up an event after going through. Oh, which one should we? Which one should we do? Which one would we have the most fun at? Um, we saw that uh, after running an event with these games, um, security can be really fun and addictive. Um, get your friends to play. We had one friend who, well, we had a few friends who ran through the levels a lot faster than we did. And we also had a couple friends who took these games home and played them for fun on the side during uh, winter break and then like ended up going through all of the games on Over the Wire, which was really cool. Um, the games are also a really good introduction to understanding how to think about applications differently. As a developer, I know that, oh, you're only supposed to use this form in this way, but actually um, nobody has to follow those rules. And, and what does it look like mentally 
to stop thinking about that. So this was a really good um, place to safely explore in that sense. Another takeaway that we had was that um, there's, there's a good deal amount of prerequisite knowledge to, um, to really get uh, a lot out of these games. It wasn't fun if you spent um, two hours just sort of staring at the screen because you didn't understand that you should have used like um, an arrow here uh, to, to get bash to execute the right way or concatenate the current, um, uh, the current uh, uh, standard in um, with what was coming out of the program. It, it was, so that, that's what could make it frustrating. If you don't really understand the systems and what's going on, you may not have as much fun. Um, so that's why we, we, when we ran the sessions, we realized this and we recommended people start with Bandit. And even though Bandit seemed um, super simple at first, the difficulty um, shoots up dramatically later on. Yeah, we started making sure that when we sent out emails for, for these events that we listed very clearly what the prere prerequisite knowledge was for, for each of these sessions. Um, so, uh, facilitation is key with these. The games are great, they make things really interesting, but if you miss a piece in the game, then you can spend the whole night just, ha just hammering against one problem, and when everyone else is just going ahead, because you missed one little bit. So, so we'd work through these games before any of the sessions that we held with more people, so we knew what to expect from each next step, and if anyone got hung up on one step, we could help them along, give them a hint, and then lead them on to the next step. Also, uh, the games are, yet again, not a really good opportunity to write secure code. Even though some of the games had the code out there for you to explore and figure out, oh, don't use C, stir copy right here. Um, the other parts of the game is just like, like black box, binary, I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, and so even though you were learning how to think about software differently, you weren't necessarily learning um, a follow-up piece around like making your own application secure and not following the same um, uh, trends and problems. So these are two of the resources that we took advantage of. Uh, the first one I hadn't talked about much because uh, we, we did a, a session around WebGoat a year ago, and um, WebGoat is an application that's uh, I mentioned before, specifically insecure. So it has a lot of examples of uh, insecure code, and you're supposed to uh, hack the application and also figure out, oh, this is where that went wrong. Uh, we tried it before, and it, it didn't go very well uh, because some of the instructions were wrong and, and um, stuff like that. So we didn't decide to, to bring it to the community. But uh, in the last couple months, we checked out uh, WebGoat's website. WebGoat's website. And um, they, they updated everything, and it looks new, so they probably made some updates to the code as well. Uh, I think it's definitely worth an opportunity, uh, a chance, if you have one, to go and check it out. Again, Over the Wire is um, over here at overthewire.org. And uh, uh, if you want to have fun with security and just thinking differently about your software, go ahead and check it out. So the other thing that we wanted to do was get involved with the security community. Um, we're going to keep mentioning this again and again, but security is so big. Uh, and, and it's not, I used to think that I could be, I could be a hero and like learn about security and be the one on the team who knows all about security. But actually, if you're working in an application that has JavaScript, obviously the website, HTML, CSS, but also Java, and like you compile with these other C libraries, like you're, you're, your, my knowledge isn't going to be, my headspace isn't going to be enough to encapsulate all the different vulnerabilities that can exist there. Uh, so we went to the conference called um, the Chaos Community Congress, which is in Hamburg, Germany. It's also called 31C. This one was 31C3 because it's been around for 31 years. Um, and we, we wanted to dive in and see what other um, mistakes and breakthroughs people have gone through. Uh, one of them was, um, for example, last December, they, they talked about um, how you could, just, just with somebody's phone number, you could track them um, through Germany as they, as they traveled uh, from south to north. Um, and, and they also uh, released information about an exploit for MacBooks. So basically, somebody could take a, uh, um, an, 
an, a VGA adapter and then change change it on the inside so that it uh, it exported firmware into your MacBook. Um, and then you just reboot the MacBook and all of a sudden you have a compromised machine. Um, other things that they talked about was were uh, like blue sky thinking. Um, if you're keeping up with the security community, a lot of people are talking about how added complexity is um, so detrimental to, to keeping your application secure. Uh, one team was researching around um, developing a more secure OS. So they looked at Linux and they cut off over 60% of Linux and tried to develop a functional operating system from that um, with the idea that, hey, we're going to think about security very specifically right now. Um, the other blue sky thinking uh, that went on was around the network and transportation layer. Uh, a lot of people are talking about how um, the application layer has so many different vulnerabilities. How can we address security at a, at a lower level than that and um, free up space for people to be more inventive uh, in, the, in the application level? So that means rewriting um, TCP IP and people were doing presentations around that. So um, when, when you think about the future of security, people are, people are presenting on these things and there's a lot of information out there online. Uh, to check out, and I, I, I highly recommend it. Um, just like getting exposure to it and listening to it, even even if you don't understand all the words that are being said, is just super super valuable. Um, the other thing that we participated in was capture the flag. Has anybody heard of capture the flag with security? Cool. Okay, good. Uh, so capture the flag is basically another security game where people it, you can have different forms of capture the flag, but the idea is you, you have an insecure application again, and there's some sort of flag in there, and you want to hack it and, and pull, out a, um, pull, pull out that flag. So when you're looking at like this uh, image web board, you see the parameter equals in the URL, and you're like, okay, that, that, that's not necessarily uh, an image there. I could like pull a flag out of there. Uh, so they have... Um, it's, it's a tiered hierarchical game, and we got a chance to play that for the first time since we, we'd al also tried like the security games as well in the past, so we thought like that would be fun. Lastly, with regards to um, 31C3, it was a really good place to network like all conferences are, like DevNexus. Meet other people who are interested in the same things that you are. Um, with, with 31C3, there were the creators of um, OTR, the cryptographic protocol OTR, there and there was also um, Richard Stallman was there, um, uh, Bunny and Xobs who lead the frontier in terms of uh, open source hardware. They were also there, so it's just a really cool place where all these people were presenting and giving information back to the security community. Um, some of the takeaways that we got from this is um, it's so crucial to to meet people because security is so big and it's not something that you can tackle by yourself. Um, definitely reach out and become a part of the community either by even just starting to follow the security list that, that Jack talk, talked about. Or like, okay, let's say that you're working specifically in Rails, go look for um, the Rails uh, mailing list around security or Spring Framework and such. Um, and also contribute if you have ideas around that. So capture the flag is or can be difficult. Um, it's, it's a very big paradigm shift to think differently about the applications that you're using or the applications that other people are creating. Not just to break them, but to make them perform in ways that you personally want them to. Um, so uh, it, it's like the security games again. If you don't have all the little pieces of the system around you uh, to really take advantage of the game, you may not have that much fun. And the, the CTF competitions that are at these conferences, like 31C3, they also have them at DEF CON. The level of competition is really quite high. They're making, they're making these competitions difficult uh, because the people that live and breathe security are doing, the, doing them for fun. So for someone just getting into security, going to a conference like DEF CON or the CCC and trying to pick up one of these capture the flag competitions might not be the best place to start. Uh, just to give you a quick example, um, at DEF CON, they'll strip down the Linux OS, so it's it's totally different, and people are like just completely in the dark when they're hacking it, to, and they're trying to figure out, oh, what's going on here, and what can I do to compromise the system? 
So here are the, some, some of the resources to the segment that I just talked about. There's a Wikipedia on the Chaos Communications Congress. If you go to their actual page, it's all in German. So if you understand German, awesome. Uh, if you don't, um, check out this page first and then see what you can do with a translator or something like that. Uh, there are also CTF write-ups. So it, it's really useful to go in and see, oh, this is, these are the steps that people took to compromise the application. And here's a link, um, for example. That, that will take you there. So, so as we as we got through this this time that we had allocated to, to just get into the security space, we uh, we started transitioning from being uh, from uh, being very exploratory and just uh, seeing for ourselves what was out there, into into thinking more about how we could start to bring this knowledge back to the rest of the company. Um, and we, and we had a bit of a bit of a like crisis period as we as we got back from this conference, where where we were thinking, okay, just what parts do we pull back? Right, we've been over here, we've been over here. There's there's good stuff everywhere. Uh, if we if we were to have a one day training session on security, what parts should we pull out and uh, and bring back to everyone else? Um, we decided that we definitely wanted to focus on secure code and not on penetration testing, not on the offensive side of things. Because although it does help to know what the attacker is going to be doing when you're, when you're programming your application, uh, thinking offensively doesn't give you the, the programming principles that are required to really solve the problems that attackers take advantage of. Um, so, so there's this organization called OWASP. Has anyone heard of OWASP? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's uh, it's really well known. It stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a uh, it's a third party nonprofit that's vendor neutral. So they're not pushing their own agenda, and they publish this list called the OWASP Top Ten every couple of years. Um, so so we'd known about this, and and we we knew what was on there. Um, and we decided to, to get started and bring some information back to the company. Let's just pick the most popular, most widespread vulnerability on the OWASP, OWASP top 10, which is injection. And this includes SQL injection. So, uh, so we were a little worried at first that this would just be too basic. We were like, okay, this has been around for a long time. Everybody knows about SQL injection, right? Um, will people even be interested in this? But as we came up to the time where we had to make a decision of what to start, uh, what knowledge to start bringing back, we said, okay, let's just try something around SQL injection and see how it goes. So we put together a workshop about an hour long on SQL injection, um, or an injection uh, in general. And we used SQL injection to illustrate this. So we put together an example application and, uh, and we divided the workshop up into three sections. We had an exploit section where you played around with the example application and pulled off a SQL injection attack. Saw it work with your own eyes. Then we transitioned into in informational where we gave, uh, where we talked about what are the secure programming principles um, that are in play to prevent SQL injection. Um, and then we switched back into the hands-on section and actually fixed fixed the example application. We shipped the, uh, the application with a broken test, uh, and when you actually ran the test, you would, you would get a failing test, uh, and it was doing a simple SQL injection attack. Um, so with, uh, with modern libraries, it's fairly easy. You use pre prepared statements, and then you fix the attack. Uh, but we'd also explain to people before they were doing this why this actually matters, and what the principles are that are at play. So injection is super classic as an attack um, and, a, and as a vulnerability. And also, um, so is buffer overflow. Um, for those who don't know, the buffer overflow is basically um, what happens when, for example, this is, this is a, pretend this is a program running. Uh, this is what it looks like in memory. Um, you've got function one, func one. Uh, and function two. Function two exists within function one as function one is being executed. So uh, the blobs <laughs> that I put up on the screen are actually memory segmentations. Um, 
So as your program is run running, you get into function one, and then you need to execute function two. Function two, um, your system creates the memory needed for function two within the stack frame, and then also inside function two, there's a little bit of memory there that gives, um, gives the, the program the ability to go back to function one when function two is, is totally done, and that's, that's a little address there. So the buffer overflow attack happens when um, you're accepting user information in function two, and then it just like overwrites usually, well, sometimes, sometimes on purpose, the address to go back to function one. And because um, the, the address disappears, you, you gain a, the ability to control the app, application from that point. Um, so this, this workshop on buffer overflow was very technically heavy. I asked people to understand assembly language. I asked them to use um, the G, new GNU debugger. Um, I asked them to um, understand memory segmentation. Um, there, it was, and this was all only the beginning. Like when you're thinking about exploiting memory, which is one of my favorite types of um, weaknesses and, and like understanding that is, is really cool to me. Um, there, there's just a lot and we hadn't even gone into like um, heap overflow and stuff like that. Um, so. Also, because it was so technically heavy, I, I ended up putting a lot of this information on videos because I wanted, pe Jack and I want people to recreate these workshops and show other, other people in the community like what is an injection vulnerability, what is a buffer overflow uh, vulnerability. So from doing these workshops, here are some of the takeaways that we got. So hands-on sections are really, really helpful. Um, it, a lot of these exploits are very difficult to explain in words. It's, it's just difficult to get across. And a great way of getting people to understand is to actually pull off the exploit themselves. Uh, it also just helps it stick. A, lo a lot of people, if you, if you put stuff up on slides and you just say, hey, here it is, here's the information, here's security, uh, they're not going to remember that when they go back to their project and they're de delivering functionality again and again. So by actually running through it, uh, we're hoping that, that they'll be able to better take this information and apply it in their day-to-day -day jobs. The other thing is that even though both of these um, workshops were about very classic, um, maybe even simple um, vulnerabilities, they did allow people to uh, think about um, injection, for example, in general, differently. So uh, it was really cool. One of my friends, Eliza, who was at uh, one of our workshops, she said, hey, like, because I understood SQL injection, um, and the syntax is a little bit different for shell, I was able to, like, take that into, into um, shell injection and understand how shell injection worked. And you can even take that to understand, like, XML injection, HTML injection. So even though the workshop was super simple, it allowed people to think differently um, on multiple different vectors. And we found out that very basic can be very helpful. Um, our worries about the SQL injection workshop just being too basic for people um, were not a thing. There were, there were a couple of people in the workshops that we ran that, uh, that did know about injection and that did say that this was review for them. But there were also lots of people that um, either they were new to the industry or they just hadn't um, ever had the need to think about this before and, and really didn't know what an in injection attack actually entailed. And this was really helpful for them. And it's also important that we focus about the we focus on the layer that people are working in. So so buffer overflows are really really good to know, and it's great information if you're getting into security. But if you're an application developer that's working in JavaScript every day, or even in Java every day, the uh, the whole ecosystem around buffer overflows is going to be unfamiliar to you. You're not going to be used to thinking about memory segmentation. You're not going to be used to thinking about pointers. And that's all something that we, uh, we would have to skill people up on before uh, learning about buffer overflows even made sense. Um, the other thing that came up again was that your architecture 
um, the architecture of the code that you're using is working against you. So even though, um, so we have all these libraries, these param parameterizations that we can use with regards to SQL injection, and we also have information about like the we now have stack canaries to stop over, uh, buffer overflows from happening. Um, in the beginning, those weren't there. And today, uh, even today, you can still use like, like um, interfaces to databases and then make the same SQL injection mistake. It, it's up to you as a developer um, not to do that. And uh, it's not inherently a part of the system that we're using. Um, so I thought that that was really interesting. Uh, why, why is that the case? What, what, what can we do in the future to change that? Um, it was just a theme that started coming up. So um, I, I talked at the beginning about giving back to the community. Jack and I have published some of these workshops online. And the goal is that other people are able to run them and like learn more about security. So feel free to check them out or um, tell us uh, what workshops you've created or how you've uh, taught other people about security and these sorts of vulnerabilities because we're really open to that um, and any feedback that you have. Yeah. So, so after the experience of running these two workshops, we decided to go full steam ahead with the OWASP threat-based workshops. Um, Cross-site scripting is another really prevalent vulnerability, and it's also a very uh, modern, relevant one. This is uh, a, a lot of developers today are working in the web space, right? We're, we're web developers, and uh, and this is a problem that exists because of the way the web is architected, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Cross-site request forgery is also uh, related and uh, almost more difficult to describe, actually. Um, but it can be just as bad, and it's something that every web developer has to code against. And sometimes that's just done for you by the framework that you're using. Rails will put a token on each of your form submits so that cross-site request forgery is not uh, as much of a problem. But if you don't know what that token is for, and you don't know why they put it there, then when you have to go um, off the beaten path and create a form for yourself, you might just leave it out. So understanding why this is a problem and how it's mitigated is really important. Vulnerable dependencies was an interesting one. This is actually hiding way at the bottom of the top 10 list. And it's just what it says. It's using components in your application with known vulnerabilities. So we talked a little before about the versions of software that you're running in your infrastructure, and it's really important to update Apache, right, and, and update all the services that are running. It's also really important to update the components that your application uses internally. Uh, a big of example of this is WordPress, right? WordPress is out there running on the public internet all over the place, and it has tons of components. These plugins are written by uh, developers a lot of the time on their free time. If you don't update these on a regular basis, then you're going to get uh, known vulnerabilities. And, um, and because most components run with the same level of privilege that your application runs, uh, a vulnerability in your component can be just as bad as a vulnerability in your application. Yeah, so going back, um, we mentioned before that exploiting um, and discovering the vulnerability and then fixing it was a really good way to get people to understand the full um, life cycle of a, of a vulnerability and like wh what part do developers need to know. Uh, one, of, one of the other, well, a few of the other takeaways that we had from that were um, people should know how to identify that your code is insecure um, just by looking at the code. Secondly, um, you should be able to show somebody why that's important. If you can show a, a cross-site scripting vulnerability and it's just a pop-up and people are like, well, I don't care, it's just a pop-up, who cares? Then, then people aren't understanding um, what can actually be done. Uh, so you need to also cover that base and make sure that people um, know that you're like risking uh, the session ID of your user and then people can use that to become an administrator or something like that. Uh, lastly, we wanted to focus on uh, fixing the code, right? We spend a lot of time um, in the realm of pen testing and um, exploring in that. But then it's also really important to handle the, the, um, the vulnerabilities that we find. And we wanted to make sure that our workshops um, 
uh, went for, like, handled, like, <laughs> went for that specifically and, and made people think about that specifically. Cool. So, so these workshops were going great, um, but they're, they're not applicable to everyone. Uh, these kind of workshops are really, um, really only apply to developers and technical QAs, which is great, but we believe that security is more than just a development concern. It's really something that the whole team should be thinking about. And threat modeling is a great way of introducing security to people that may not be that technical. So, uh, so our coworker Cade had been working on some threat modeling workshops. He came over to San Francisco, and we worked through a few of them with him. Um, we, so there are, there are lots of approaches to threat modeling. We picked two of them. The first one is STRIDE. So STRIDE stands for spoofing, tampering, non-repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege, which is a big list of all, basically all the different ways that something can go wrong in your application. And the idea behind Stride is that you want to be thinking of each of these because it doesn't take, um, it's, it's not only like a complete remote code execution vulnerability that you need to be worried about. A lot of the time it can be something as simple as, oh, my application keeps a lot of file handles open and makes it very easy for one user to use up the maximum number of file, his, file handles on my server and then prevent any other users from accessing the site. Um, and thinking about using, you know, thinking with these different hats uh, can help you um, help you realize that there's a there's a specific problem with your application. Um, we also talk about attack trees, which are a really great way of um, defining and then also communicating your threat model. Uh, so attack trees are centered around a certain goal that it, that an attacker might have, like open a safe. And then the tree details that all the different paths that an, an attacker might take in order to achieve that goal. So something we hear about a lot is that the, the business stakeholders uh, on our projects will, will say things like, well, that's that XSS attack. That's just someone injecting code into the HTML. Uh, it's not like they can, they can buy an item for free or anything, right? It's not like they can leak a whole production database, so, so that doesn't really matter that much. The reality is that lots of compromises are multi-step, and all of these vulnerabilities can add up to a path that can lead to an attacker doing something really bad, uh, and attack trees are a great way to visualize that. So a big takeaway is that secure delivery is not just technical. Um, we, we want to involve project managers, we want to involve BAs, because our project managers are going to be the ones that are fighting for the time that we need to implement things properly in the first place. And our BAs are going to be the ones that have the knowledge of what business uh, assets are the most important to protect. And we can use their knowledge to decide where we should spend our most time securing the application. We also realize that it really helps to make these sessions relevant to the projects that people are working on. So the first time we ran the threat modeling workshop, we, uh, we went through a threat, defining a threat model for a contrived example application. And we realized that actually there's no need to make up an, ex uh, an example application. All of the people that we're talking to are working on actual projects, and most of them will not have threat models. So, so now we've moved to actually creating a, this, at least the starting point of a threat model for the applications that developers and PMs and BAs, everyone on the team, uh, are actually working on. And we also started to think about agile security. So threat models, a lot of the time, are done at the beginning of projects. You know, you're, you're getting everything together, you're thinking about maybe what your requirements might be, and you do a threat model. And then a team will move into delivery, and deliver, and deliver, and deliver features, and then get to the end of the, of the project, and then they have to deploy the application, and they go, oh no, is it actually secure? 
did we uh, did we did anything in our threat model? Um, is there a, is there an easy way to exploit anything? Uh, so they'll do a pen test, right? And they'll get a company in and do a pen test, and they'll get a big audit back, and then you'll fix everything. And that's okay, but we can do better than that. We can be thinking about our threat model every time we pick up a story, right? Uh, and maybe we do spend some time at the beginning of the project to think a lot about the threat model, but each time we pick up a story, we should at least be asking ourselves the question, does this change my threat model, right? And that way we won't be front-loading and post-loading all of the security work that we're doing. We integrate it into part of our everyday workflow. I also wanted to mention um, that one of our coworkers, Daniel Summerfield, is giving a really cool talk tomorrow about the different patterns for addressing security. And he's going to talk about uh, the security sandwich that we just mentioned. So. So Microsoft has a card game called Elevation of Privilege. Uh, this is for teaching the stride mentality. And uh, it's a fun way of getting people to think about all these different ways that their system could be compromised. So we've been playing this with teams as part of our threat modeling workshop. And then I'd also really recommend taking a look at attack trees. They're a great, very visual way of talking about security with people that might not care about security that much. Okay, cool. So we we traveled through Jack and my journey through, um, into security as developers, not really focused primarily on security, and now like doing it full time. And so I, I ran through a bunch of different takeaways that we had um, in each, in each section, but we want to hammer home a few things um, at the very end. One is security is gigantic. Oh my gosh. Um, so focus on the relevant parts uh, to your specific section. Um, I mentioned before, look up uh, Rails vulnerabilities, look up Spring Framework vulnerabilities. What are your person, what are your um, vulnerable dependencies on your project? Are you aware of those? And uh, what, what different um, versions can you change and stuff like that? Uh, secondly, team up with the community. Um, you can't eat the security padlock all by yourself. <laughs> so, uh, like, talk with pe talk with people, join up, um, and communicate. Also, contribute. If you have some really interesting key information, um, talk to others about it so that everybody can be safe. Lastly, find good mentors. So, Jack and I were really lucky to have other people at ThoughtWorks that we could go to and talk to. Um, Daniel, uh, Joanne Moleski, um, or Molski, sorry. Um, uh, John Stojanovsky, like all these people who could advise us about security, but they also took a step back and let us um, explore on our own and mistakes on our uh, make mistakes on our own. Um, for example, exploring um, the sexy world of penetration testing and realizing, like, oh, this is not really going to be um, as pertinent to uh, application development in my day to day. Uh, so that was really, really cool and really key. Next, um, architecture built without security in mind leads to unintention unintentional endemic problems. Um, so we talked about C and Linux and the buffer overflow and how it originally um, was made without the idea of somebody um, maliciously trying to break into the stack, right? And now today we have um, web browsers with HTML and JavaScript and uh, CSS. And you'll see that like, the, the lines between data in, in um, the C and Linux architecture and the lines um, between data in web browsers are both kind of, they, they're just fuzzy. And when they get too fuzzy, people don't, like, like you have uh, arbitrary code execution um, and stuff like that. So of course we made some, there are some mitigations with uh, stack canaries that I mentioned before. And uh, people are segmenting um, different parts of code now in the web browsers. But at the same time, we, we haven't exactly learned um, to make those, make those lines very clear from the, from the beginning when you're architecting technology. Can we yeah. add anything? It's really interesting that that separation between data and code is still so much of a problem. In a buffer overflow, you're supplying code where the program expected data and then you're tricking the program into executing your input, right? In uh, cross-site scripting attacks, you're giving some JavaScript, again, some code into a form element that was just expecting data, 
and the browser will still execute that code, right? Uh, and we just, as an industry, we haven't learned our lesson there. Um, next, it would be nice to see more resources around secure coding. When we started off on this journey, we found a lot of books on um, bug hunting, on uh, penetration testing, and offensive security is just a plethora of information. But there, there were only a couple books around um, defense and making your secure code um, uh, and secure code strategy. So it would be nice to see more from the community. Um, so Bruce Schneier is super cool in this space, in the security space. If you're, you aren't following him now and you are interested in security, I highly recommend that you check him out. Um, one, of his, one of his quotes is, security is a product, is not a product, it is a process. Oh, we, we laughed about me messing <laughs> up on that one. Um, so for example, you, you can, can't buy security on the, shel on the shelf and expect to be secure. You can't just buy this uh, password management app and say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm cool now. Uh, when you think about password management, it's, it's like, okay, I have, this um, sort of characterized, um, this specially characterized password for this website, I have another one, like 12 characters here, more characters here, and you have different usernames. It's just, it's a whole system. And when you also think about um, GPG and public and private keys, you have to think about like not having one private and public key pair. You, you want to have one master key and a few other, that signs a few other keys that you can use. To secure, um, to secure your communication. So it, it is a process that other people are thinking about. Um, secondly, I wanted to hit home that it's, security is everybody's responsibility. Um, it's not just the security team's responsibility. It's not just the QA's responsibility. If everybody, at, even as a developer, if I can get rid of those low-hanging security problems, um, that low-hanging fruit, then uh, that frees up time for QAs to tackle the much harder manual steps around that, uh, around security. Or um, it's also important to communicate to people who work in finance, like, like we, need to, we need to make time, we need to increase our estimations uh, to make sure that we're coding securely here. And agile security is, it really is a new frontier. When, when I started, uh, exploring the world of security, I expected a lot more information to just be out there, and especially around secure coding and uh, and how to how to actually do modern agile security work. Uh, there's just not a lot of information. There aren't a ton of books. Uh, there aren't a lot of really good resources to rely on. So that's this is something that we're going to have to work on as an industry going forward. Okay, cool. So thanks everybody for coming out to our talk. Um, once again, if you are contributing to workshops in this space or in general for other people to learn from, please contact us. These are our GitHub um, IDs. Also, um, if you're interested in any of the workshops that we've done, a couple of them are up there. Um, and then, um, yes, uh, if you have it, if you, this is the first time going for you to go into the security community, welcome. Um, have a fun trip with us. Lastly, we have time for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yes? Did you have any resources available for the cross-site scripting? Yeah, yes. So, uh, so I definitely recommend checking out OWASP. Um, and they have a ton. It's just like, it's going to be a block of text that you can read. And um, like that's useful if you, I, I like reading, so... Uh, but in terms of some more hands-on stuff, um, the the war games we mentioned, uh, there's one of those that's very focused on web application security, and that includes some cross-site scripting. Uh, I'm not sure which which one it is. Um, I can. Um, there's one that. Yeah, I would just check it out. I would go to Over the Wire and then see what they have on there. Also, um, if you. If you go to my GitHub, it says that I forked a repository from um, Daniel Summerfield, which is cross-site scripting presentation, and inside is an actual app that you can play with and see like what's happening. So, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Cool. Thank right. you. Thank you. And good luck. Out. <laughs>